All right, this is concept two notes in our homeostasis extension mini unit. And we're gonna talk a little bit, do an intro into cell signaling and communication. So why does this matter? In complex multicellular organisms specifically, they must have methods for communication on a cellular level in order to maintain homeostasis. I mean, think about humans. We're said to have trillion, trillions of cells that make us up. If those cells can't work together for common functions, then there's gonna be a massive breakdown. So communication and signaling is key. Cell signaling allows cells to process information from their environment, so stimuli, and then communicate that information to other cells. And these signals can be physical, like heat or light change, but they can also be chemical too. Ligands, a ligand, that's a specific term to represent molecules that bind to other molecules, called receptor proteins for signaling purposes. So this would be like the signaling molecule. And we're gonna talk more about them over the next few slides. So a signal transduction pathway, what is that? It's a sequence of events initiated by a signal that leads to a cellular response. So our environmental or chemical stimuli, whatever it may be, initiates a signal. That signal transduces a message that gets passed along a pathway until the desired response gets initiated. So three, to, to oversimplify this, because that's what I'm going to have to do for the sake of understanding, there are kind of three parts to this. You have your signal, you have whatever is receiving your signal called the receptor, and then we have the response that we hopefully eventually get. So here is a little diagram that kind of shows what I'm talking about here. So this yellow molecule would be my ligand, some sort of signal. This is extracellular fluid and this is cytoplasm. So we can infer that this gray line here is our cell membrane. So we have a receptor molecule, a receptor protein that's in the cell membrane. It's gonna receive that signal. When that happens, these arrows show that signal's getting passed along until we get whatever response it is that we desire. So, First, let's talk about the signal part of the signal transduction pathway. I'm gonna talk just about chemical signals, but remember there are environmental ones too. So first, one type of chemical signal is an autocrine signal. So that prefix auto means self. So this is a self signal. This is where you're sending a signal from the same cell that is gonna release them. So let me show you a picture that'll help. All right, so let's say this is our cell and this is our signaling molecule, our ligand. That same cell that's releasing the signal is also gonna have a receptor protein that's gonna receive that signal. So this, this cell right here is our signaling cell or also known as our secreting cell and it's also our target cell or another word for target cell is our receiving or our response cell. Real world example of this are prostaglandins. These aid in muscle contraction and then muscle relaxation and dilating and constricting your blood vessels and then also just modulating inflammation and they work by autocrine signaling, so self-signaling. All right, another type of chemical signal is a paracrine signal and this is just when a signal diffuses to a nearby cell, so it's not going to go very far. Okay, so we have our signaling cell or our secreting cell. It's going to secrete the signal, and it's just going to go to another cell that's nearby. That's going to be our target cell with our receptor protein that's going to receive that signal. Paracrine signals, this is how electrical signals in neurotransmitters are conducted from a nerve cell to a muscle cell or to another nerve cell that's nearby. Another type of chemical signal is juxtacrine signals. These require direct contact between the signaling cell and the receiving cell. So here's our signaling cell, and it's going to have the signal right there, and it's got to be super close. It's going to have to be touching. That receptor protein, there's going to have to be some sort of physical connection between the receiving cell so that it can then receive the signal. This is how some growth factors work in your body that are critical for developing cardiac and neural functions in our body. But this is also how a lot of unicellular organisms like bacteria communicate. There is direct contact between two bacteria that then pass a signal between each other. And then the last type of chemical signal I want to highlight are hormones. 
Hormones are signals that can travel to distant cells. So another word for this is endocrine signaling. They can get in a blood vessel and they can travel down that blood vessel to a cell on, in an entirely different part of the body that has the appropriate receptor protein to receive the signal. And that can be our target cell with hormones. So some examples, <clears throat> progesterone and testosterone, those are hormones that are important in regulating reproduction. And those are hormones that can travel far distances through the blood in order to be received by a target cell that's not nearby. Okay, so that's an overview of signaling. Let's talk about these receptors and what's receiving these ligand molecules, these signals. So a receptor is a protein where the signal gets received on the target cell. Now, receptors can be intracellular, so inside of the cell. Now, if a receptor is inside of the cell, that means that whatever the signal is, whatever that ligand is, has to be able to cross the barrier of the cell membrane to get into the receptor. So these ligands would need to be small and or nonpolar so that they can diffuse across the cell membrane easily to reach these intracellular receptors. So that's going to take it back to some things we learned about in our cellular transport um, concept in our cells unit. So understanding that concept. Now, in the pictures I've been showing you, we've just been looking at membrane receptors. So even right here, the receptor that's right just on that cell membrane. So these are located on the surface of the cell, and these would be for signals that are large and or polar that wouldn't be able to diffuse through the cell membrane to get to an intracellular receptor. So they have to be on the membrane. And receptors are highly specific. Okay, so remember, proteins have four levels of structure primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. They're highly specific. And receptors are also three-dimensional. So only certain ligands can bind certain receptors. This is a highly specific and regulated process. So let's say this is a ligand and this is a receptor. These would bind perfectly. This ligand would not bind to this receptor. Those will not work because they are not specific and they don't go together. All right, so that's just a small overview on receptors. One last thing, though, I want to talk about, too, is this kind of bond we're referring to. When a ligand binds to a receptor protein, the bond is non-covalent, so it's not very strong at all, and it's reversible. So it's not something that's going to be a permanent connection that's going to happen. This allows us to regulate it more easily because we can make things bind and not bind a lot simpler. Now, something that can happen, though, at our receptors are inhibitors. Inhibitors are molecules that can block where a normal ligand is supposed to go, and that prevents communication. One of my favorite examples is caffeine. That's why we've got the coffee here, and this is what a caffeine molecule looks like. So caffeine is a large and polar molecule, and it binds to receptors on nerve cells in your brain. And its structure is very similar to adenosine. And adenosine binds to receptors after you've done an activity or you're stressed and initiates feelings of drowsiness in those nerve cells in your brain. So what caffeine does, because it has a similar shape to adenosine, it is able to bind the same receptor that adenosine does. So it prevents that receptor from activating a response. So instead of feelings of drowsiness that you should feel if you're stressed or um, you know, you've know you had a lot of activity or something, instead the person remains alert instead of feeling tired because caffeine is blocking those signals of tiredness from being sent, which I think is really fascinating. And there we could go into so much more detail on receptors. There's ion channel receptors and protein kinase receptors and G-protein linked receptors. And that's something I cover a lot with my AP Bio students. But just for the sake of intro to biology, I want you to have an appreciation for just kind of the big picture here. So we've talked about signals, talked a little bit about receptors. Now let's talk about this transduction part of the signal transduction pathway. All right, so transduction. This is the passing along of the signal until the desired response is reached. This can be a short process. It can be very short transduction from the receptor right to one thing, right to response, or it can be really long if a signal cascade of reactions is induced where one thing causes another thing to happen, which causes another, and so on and so on. The passing along of the message usually happens by changing the shape of different proteins. That's kind of how these signals get turned on and turned off and passed along and not. And a couple ways that we can change a protein shape. Phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So 
Phosphorylation is the addition of a phosphate group, um, which is done by enzymes called kinases. And this isn't going to mean a lot to you for those of you that we haven't covered um, protein structure and specifically amino acids that make up proteins. We haven't covered their structure in detail. But essentially, amino acids have these R groups on them. And whatever the structure is of that R group really affects the structure then of the amino acid and thus the proteins that the amino acids make up. And a phosphate group is something that can be added to these amino acids and then that's going to change the chemical composition of the amino acid and thus change the shape of the protein. So I just want you to be exposed to these terms. So know that phosphorylation is adding a phosphate group and an enzyme called kinases does that. And then dephosphorylation would be removing a phosphate group and that's done by an enzyme, enzyme called phosphatases. So key idea here is something that I keep bringing up over and over. Form dictates function. If the shape changes, if the form of a molecule is changing, that's going to affect the function of the molecule. And that's going to change and that's going to affect how we signal and how we communicate, how we can do so many things. So this is really important in terms of how we pass along the message. One more thing about transduction is sometimes there's a second messenger that's involved in stimulating the transduction of a signal. So a second messenger is a small molecule, and it's going to serve as an intermediate between the receptor protein and then the cascade of responses that happen after. And this is, again, this is a key way we regulate what's going on inside of us. These secondary messengers either distribute a signal or they can even amplify initial signal so that it's received to another receptor. And a key example of this is a molecule called CAMP uh, or cyclic AMP. It's a secondary messenger that's really important in your fight or flight response, which has to do with epinephrine and adrenaline hormones um, that get activated. Okay. Last thing I want to touch on is that response portion. So eventually, the goal of a signal transduction pathway is to trigger a specific response. One signal can cause a ton of different responses. So that's why I show it going a bunch of different arrows here. It can cause a bunch of different things to happen. So what are some of these responses? What could that mean? It could mean the opening of an ion channel. If we change the balance of an ion concentration inside and outside of the cell, that can affect what's being transported in and out of the cell. One of the really big things that happens in these signal transduction pathways is an alteration in gene expression. So how your genes are expressed and how often they're expressed is highly regulated. Your genes and your chromosomes are not constantly on or off. So Signal transduction pathways. This signaling can cause some genes to be switched on or upregulated and then some to be switched off or downregulated. So that's one of the key responses we see in these pathways. Also, it could just be an alteration of enzyme activities. This is something we talked about in concept one when we talked about feedback loops and how the activity in an enzyme really affects metabolic pathways because me enzymes are super critical in regulating different pathways. So these are just a couple of examples of responses that can be initiated in these signal transduction pathways. And that is your brief overview of cell signaling and communication.